Hi everyone, I'm Bruno Aziza and welcome to another episode of Data Journeys. This is where we come to learn from leaders, their do's, their don'ts, and the details of their journey. Today, I'm talking to Paul, who's the CTO of W Promote, an amazing organization that's been able to automate thousands of hours of work and also works at an amazing scale. We're going to talk about 30,000 jobs run nightly and the enablement of hundreds of employees to provide great services to their customers. So Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Let's get started. What is W Promote about? W Promote is the largest independent performance marketing agency in the United States. As a performance marketing agency, we have a tremendous amount of data that we're, in, we're uh, managing for our clients. Uh, time is of the essence, so performance is important. So scale is also incredibly important because we've doubled our size year over year for the last three years. We've got uh, over 30 platforms uh, out there. We know that you know our marketers uh, and our clients are going to use every possible marketing platform. We need to collect that data every night, get it into a system so that we can report on it, analyze it, and provide insights to make decisions today. So 30 unique platforms. You have the need to provide great insights to customers uh, every time. And before you joined the company, there was a lot of manual work. So a big part of, of your journey was around automation. Tell us a little bit about that. How did that get started? Yeah, early on uh, when I came to the company, <clears throat> you know, the goal was just to automate as much as possible. <clears throat> when you're um, when you're dealing with all these different marketing platforms, it it is often a manual process. Someone uh, that's working with a uh, client A goes and downloads their data, puts it in an Excel spreadsheet, analyzes it, makes a decision, makes another buy, and on and on. And we have, you know, marketing science people, data scientists that are doing something similar. They're pulling down large troves of data, perhaps three years of data, doing analysis and doing forward forecasting. All of that is ripe for automation, um, starting with making sure that we have all the data in a timely manner and a single source of truth so that everyone's using the same data. In addition, the, the way that we process the data, the way that we um, uh, visualize the data and the reporting can be automated. On the flip side, we were um, in the beginning and four years ago, we would use Excel or Google Sheets, just like many other agencies. But then uh, we migrated to Data Studio. Data Studio was a godsend. The user experience was so much better and we became really pro proficient at building Data Studios. But Data Studios are a manual build. I can't automate that. I can't, you know, through code, spin up another instance of, of a Data Studio like the last one or manipulate it. So there was a there's a huge opportunity for us to automate both sides of that, the collection of the data. So that could be uh, streamlined and the uh, visualization and reporting of the data. In the middle, we had a huge opportunity to democratize what our marketing science teams had done. Much of the algorithms for anomaly detection, cluster analysis and others um, were now so well understood that we could convert those into microservices and run them against every customer's data. And so that was a huge value add that um, that uh, allowed more, if not all, of our customers to take advantage of, of our marketing science. So we're talking about amazing transformation here. You used to spend thousands of hours doing reporting, sometimes three plus weeks doing reporting, now turned to 30 minutes. So really quite an amazing uh, journey and something you accomplished through this project you called Polaris. What does Polaris do? What's the infrastructure under Polaris? And tell us a little bit more about this transformation you went through. Sure. We, we had an internal system uh, called Bixby. W Promote's always made tremendous investments in, in technology. And to be clear, all of this technology um, is for us. We don't sell this or license this. Um, it's really about um, supporting the internal teams that are doing the amazing marketing. Um, so Bixby is a, a CRM. It's where we track um, all of our clients and um, how they're how they're doing, what their performance is, who's working on them, what services they bought. That that existed. I wanted to automate the collection of of, of data, so I knew that I would have to find um, a platform that was entirely API driven that I could integrate with, or uh, or or build my own if necessary. And uh, so, I, I guess what I what I what I want to say is. I started on this journey of figuring out how am I going to um, iterate on what we already have. I could have a, a bunch of loosely uh, co connected tools 
or I could build something that was more reusable. And that's how it started. And today we, we talk about Polaris as a platform and that's what it is, but that's not what it started out as. It started out as let's just be smart um, about how we, uh, we reuse things. So first of all, I needed to have a place that I was gonna use for my data store. In the past, we'd used Postgres and MongoDB. And in my previous uh, life, I'd use uh, Redshift and, and others. So there was a lot of data and our data scientists had been using BigQuery. And I'd heard things about BigQuery and uh, I wasn't certain if it was the right solution. But after an introduction and doing some tests and really just looking at, at, at what was it was capable of, I was, I was pretty awestruck. And I thought, okay, um, this is a great product. I'm gonna make this my single source of truth. This is where all of our client data, and that's the bulk of our data is you know the, every night we're pulling in the marketing uh, reports and we, we store those. Um, and also it needs to be very performant so that we can report on it. Everyone needs the reports almost at the same time every morning, right? <clears throat> so that's what started us towards um, Google Cloud Platform. A lot of our stuff was in other clouds. Um, we had, um, um, everyone was allowed to kind of build their own thing, um, but uh, with, with two things, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. BigQuery was a huge, huge uh, differentiator. So we started there. But I'd also heard of Looker. In my previous role, I had in, investigated Looker. But when you're at a software company that you know is building proprietary software, you're not going to license something like Looker. That's that's giving too much of the value of the company to someone else. But when you're an agency, that's exactly what you're going to do. You're not going to reinvent the wheel. You're you're going to buy versus build. So <clears throat> it was an important test. I needed to make sure that it could be completely automated. I needed to be able to spin up new instances of, of dashboards because I've got hundreds growing to thousands of clients. And so I need to be able to do that in an automated way. Um, I wanted to be able to also take advantage of that um, data model, the look ML, because if, if it wasn't in Looker, I would have had to do that myself. Even when I have the data in a common schema, I still need to create a unique data model per client. Each business is different. Sometimes it's e-commerce, sometimes it's lead gen. Sometimes the definition of a conversion is different. All of that needs to be managed and handled and, and expressed in code for each client. Because right now what was happening is you would log into the data studio for customer A and change the formulas hidden underneath the hood, you know, and you do it for customer B. But there was no easy way to inspect that. There was no easy way to know whether we'd made the change somewhere in the database via some view or story procedure or, uh, or whether we'd made the change elsewhere. I, I was going to, if we're gonna operate at scale, we're going to have clear um, layers of, 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 of abstraction so that we can inspect this. And it's all going to be code. Well, at that point, I've got BigQuery and I've got Looker that are foundational to my new architecture. And so we start, leaning in. I'm like, okay, everything that we build from now on is going to be on Google Cloud Platform. And there was a little bit of a groan because it was new. A lot of my engineers were very comfortable with other uh, platforms. And so it was like, oh, but I, I have to tell you, jumping ahead, uh, I, I checked with my, my engineers just recently uh, to make sure I can speak for them. But they're delighted. They actually are, one of the things that they said is working with Google Cloud has been a delight especially around things like permissions. It's just so intuitive now and it's so much easier than the way that you break things down into projects and the way that we can easily um, assign and know explicitly what we've assigned as permissions um, at every level. That's uh, That was one thing. But uh, and, and the other thing is um, um, BigQuery has been a dream. But let me step back. We, um, we, we started using um, App Engine uh, because we're, we were going to replace the foundation, the notion that everything was going to be an app. I just wanted people to think about this so that it didn't become um, a collection of things. I wanted them to be uh, sharing a framework. So I wanted to be in Python, so we use Django. So we're gonna build Django apps. And the very first app was to recreate the functionality of the Bixby CRM. And so you do it in a very modern best practices way and you've now defined the architecture for every other app's user interface. So we used React as the front end. We um, all, all of the all of the layers of, of the choices that we made became a toolkit for us 
and other people in the company to be able to build apps quickly. Because often that was the thing. The magic of what the other people were doing was a small gem in the center, but they were struggling with the user interface. They tried to put Google Sheets as the front end and, and Google Sheets as the, as the database. And it's like, no, you have access to the database and you have a real front end now. Um, so what is that little gem? What is the, the insight that your code generates? Let's bring that at scale to the whole company, not just to the few uh, clients that you've, that you've done it for. So uh, anyways, that, that's what started us on the journey. Once you get in, you go like, oh crap, there's so much good stuff in here. And, and uh, we've, we've taken advantage of Cloud Run. We've got um, um, uh, you know, load balancing. We, we, when we got into our, what we call Project Kraken, which we'll, we'll definitely talk about, um, we knew that need, needed to be on Kubernetes. So we're spinning up Kubernetes. And um, the long story short, the way we are now is we're looking to basically We've, we've, we're in the process and almost complete dockerizing everything and moving that into Kubernetes. All right, well, Paul, you talked about the need to automate. So what was your observation between BigQuery and the rest of the market when it comes to automating and scaling? Well, for scaling, um, remember, I had a small team. We started with three engineers uh, and for uh, the first six months, it was those three engineers. And what we were uh, embarking on was a huge project. And one of the challenges that I faced in the past that other companies uh, using other cloud platforms um, in my previous company, as I said, I used Redshift. Tuning it, getting it to scale, getting it to perform, um, getting queries to respond quickly uh, as you're hitting it really hard, both writing it because we're pulling in so much data overnight and then reading it because all of our clients wake up at eight o'clock in the morning in their time zone and they wanna see how their performance was. So. I'd never experienced a database that um, would just handle it. And my, the way I used to say it is like, Google will move earth and mountains to uh, respond to my query. So as long as I'm smart about constructing those queries efficiently, it's really cost effective as well. So that was a huge part of our scale. We're not afraid that we're going to spend a bunch of money because we just need to be smart. We've made mistakes, but we've, we've learned from them very quickly and, uh, and it wasn't that expensive. I know we could talk about your experience uh, today for, for hours, but I want to step back because this is not your first rodeo. And I want to kind of have you talk about what you've learned along your career, the, the good news and, and the bad news, the best practices and the worst practices. And so let's start with maybe the, the good news. What are some of the best practices you've learned? What would be you know, advice you would give to people listening to us that they must do when they think about automation, iteration, scale? and standardization just like you did here? First of all, standard, logical, but it's it's really important you hold the line. Don't try to boil the ocean. Look for the first useful thing. Some people talk about, you know, minimum viable product, but when when you're talking, when you're working th with your stakeholders um, to define what the ultimate solution is, that's important. We need to know what the pie in the sky ultimate deliverable is. But if you say to them, like, if I could just give you one thing, what would that be? It's very revealing because it often is something very simple. I talk about it as power steering versus full self-driving. And, and often just giving them the power steering was a huge um, um, advantage uh, to them and it delighted them. Sometimes you'll find that that was all they needed and you really didn't need to um, build the full solution. Um, that, that's, that's, a, that's a big one. Also, one of the things that that I've learned, um, or maybe it's just, um, I don't know how I learned it. It became uh, um, the, the way that I build software. Is even if it's for internal audiences, treat everything as a product. The reason for that is it gets respect. It has a name, it has a thing, it has a roadmap. It's been thingified, it has a roadmap. The, um, that also allows you to create space around it to be successful. Um, if, if it's just a, a feature, if it's just, uh, if you're just constantly iterating on, on um, requests, um, they don't get the respect. You're also going to want to make sure that if it's a product, that it um, has a user experience that is the best it can be. That there's a QA person, at least one, assigned to this. Engineering teams often don't have QA. It's not a big problem. It's like, if it's a product, it should have QA. It's just a way of thinking, changing the thinking of the company. Um, and then you should have documentation. 
And what we're doing is we're, 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 we're totally embracing this. And we, we do the, the, the ideation, the, the, the prioritization, the roadmap, what's the first useful thing. Um, then we design the user experience. Then we, we build that first useful thing and get it in the client's hands. And uh, after it's gone through QA, we do documentation and we do training. You have to do just the, even the most minimal, which could be an, uh, an annotated walkthrough of someone using it and put that up as a little um, icon next to this new feature that you've added to this ever-growing um, platform. Any of that is valuable, but all of it is, is the best solution. So I like this concept of, of the walkthrough. What about the opposite of that? What are the things that people must avoid at all costs? Sometimes you know these decisions make sense in the beginning of the journey, but then you realize as you go on that maybe if you made the decision differently or not, or made a completely different decision, it would have changed the course of your journey. You know, you've got any of those? It's easy to get drawn into, you think you figured it out. You, 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 you laid it all out. You talk to the vendors, you know how you're going to solve the problem. The problem is very, very big. And as you go along and you discover that it's not working the way that you thought it should work, you might go, yeah, but it should. And you'll just keep chewing away at it and you'll keep aiming for that original solution that you had defined. Well, that's um, that's often gonna lead to failure and it certainly won't allow you to uh, find um, new opportunities. And it's, it's really the definition of waterfall versus agile, right? So if you're being truly agile in every sense, you're reacting to, well, this is a lot harder. Should we lean in? And that's too much we need to pull back and go around and find another solution. And by the way, technology changes all the time. So um, your original solution might not be the best solution today. Well, Paul, thank you so much for the time today. We learned a lot about automation, scaling processes, thinking about data platforms and everything being an API, and of course, the ability to iterate. Thank you so much, Paul, for the time today. Great. Thanks for having me. All right, well, if you want to find out more about stories just like this one, we want to make sure you click on the link down below. Until next time, I'm Bruno Ziza.